Hello guys, I'm Grandmaster Grigor Grigorov and I'm really excited to start a series of lectures featuring some most important pawn structures. Today we are going to examine a game which is a perfect illustration of the fight against an isolated D pawn. So, uh, probably uh, you know that uh, the isolated pawn is uh, one of the most important uh, structures in chess because uh, you can get uh, this pawn structure in almost um, every opening. That's why uh, you should uh, really focus uh, on uh, this important topic. So, uh, in, uh, this, uh, in the example that uh, I'm going to uh, comment uh, today uh, my for my trainer uh, grandmaster viktor gavrikov uh, is playing with black against uh, the Lithu lithuanian uh, master gedimindas rastenis so uh, let's uh, make the opening moves so we have uh, a nimtsu indian defense uh, c4 e6 knight c3 bishop b4 e3 c5 bishop d3 knight c6 knight e2 here uh, in this lecture i'm not going to focus on the opening because our topic is the isolated pawn so uh, when uh, you see this uh, tension in the center which is quite typical for the rubinstein variation in, of nimtsu indian defense it's quite clear that uh, black can force the transition uh, into a position with an isolated pawn and here, uh, actually, I think that uh, this transition is very favorable for black because of one very specific reason. So c takes d4, e takes d4, d c4, bishop c4, short castle. And here uh, we shall try to uh, evaluate the structure uh, for a while. So it's clear that uh, the isolated pawn provides space advantage. Uh, that's why uh, in the middle game white will have more opportunities uh, to maneuver his pieces and in general uh, the side uh, which is playing with an isolated pawn uh, is trying to build up an attack mostly against the king so uh, typical idea should be uh, queen d3 as, as, uh, very often uh, there is uh, such kind of a battery along this diagonal b1 h7 this bishop uh, is often being transferred to c2 or b1 depending on the circumstances usually uh, white plays bishop g5 by pinning the f6 knight uh, and of course the f6 knight is a very important defender of the h7 pawn uh, this is uh, a typical stuff and in different lectures uh, we are going to examine uh, different attacking ideas uh, for white. Here we will mostly uh, focus on the play against the isolated pawn. But uh, for now uh, you should just know that uh, when uh, you are playing with an isolated pawn you should try to uh, build up an attack because in the long term the isolated pawn will be, will be a weakness. Why uh, this particular version of isolated pawn is favorable for black? It's mainly because of this e2 knight in general. Uh, in such kind of positions the knight belongs to f3 because uh, whenever black tries to block the pawn in some way for example knight uh, e7 knight d5 or uh, let's say knight b4 knight d5 the f3 knight will occupy the important e5 square that's why uh, having the knight on e2 is not uh, very favorable for white and I consider this version to be uh, very favorable for black. So how we, we need to play against an isolated pawn? Uh, this, uh, this is the topic of the lecture. First of all, in the middle game, you should try to uh, safely block the pawn. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, you need to control very well the square in front of the pawn. So in this case, the d5 square. And of course, uh, when you are playing against isolated pawn, you try to exchange pieces and force the transition into an end game, uh, which will be very favorable for you because the isolated pawn will be very weak in every end game. 
and uh, actually uh, this strategy was very well uh, illustrated by Grandmaster Viktor Gavrikov in this particular game. So bishop g5 was played, uh, bishop e7 neutralizing the pin and here you, you see the move a3, very thematic idea in positions with isolated pawn. White takes the control of the b4 square and uh, in this way uh, black cannot make the maneuver knight b4, knight d5 in order to block the pawn. Additionally, uh, white uh, wants something else by playing a3. So very often he can play queen d3, rook d1, let's say bishop a2, bishop b1. And uh, in all these lines, um, black cannot uh, bother the queen uh, by means of knight b4. That's why a a the move a3 is a multi-purpose move in such uh, structures. So uh, what is black's main strategical problem now? Uh, he should uh, somehow uh, develop the queenside bishop. There are two ways to do so, a6 at b5, followed by bishop b7, or uh, b6, which was played in the game. So queen d3, bishop b7, rook d1. So white is uh, mobilizing um, his forces, uh, and uh, he's already um, considering the idea of transferring the bishop to b1 or c2, uh, bishop b3, bishop c2, or bishop a2, bishop b1. Uh, since the knight is not on f3 but on e2, now uh, the idea of opening the position by advancing the pawn does not work quite well because black will always have knight e5 uh, at his disposal. But what should black do in this position? I think that uh, black should uh, mainly care about the control of the d5 square but uh, in that regard, our c6 knight is quite problematic. Uh, because uh, knight b4 is not possible, knight e7, knight d5 um, is not possible as well, because we have a bishop on e7. And uh, if the knight stays on c6, uh, this will impact uh, on the activity of the bishop, which is closed now. That's why uh, you should know a typical way of handling such positions. So uh, very often uh, people play knight h5, uh, which is a typical idea, uh, with the intention of recapturing on e7 with the knight. This is a thematic idea. And after that, black will get his knight back to f6. And uh, of course, the exchange of the dark squared bishops uh, works pretty well for black. After that, knight d5. But what is the problem with the immediate knight h5? Actually, uh, white can play bishop c1. Uh, the bishop is participating uh, in the game via the initial square. And uh, it turns out that uh, the move knight h5 uh, was just uh, a waste of time. That's why uh, Gavrikov uh, decided to, to execute the same idea uh, under more favorable circumstances. He just starts with h6 in order to clarify the position of the bishop. So here, uh, if black white plays uh, bishop h4, then we can play knight h5. And this time, uh, white will be forced to exchange his dark squared bishop. So after bishop takes e7, knight e7, then uh, if white does not uh, opt for equality by playing the immediate d5, black will just uh, play knight f6, uh, knight d5, queen d6, rook d8. Slowly but surely uh, he will be increasing the pressure uh, and uh, of course he will try to exchange as many uh, minor pieces as possible. In the long term the pressure on d4 will be very annoying. That's why after h6, uh, he played uh, bishop uh, c1. And here, uh, once again, uh, th th we have this problem uh, with uh, the c6 knight. But since there is no pin along the diagonal h4 d8, we have this typical idea in our, uh, at our disposal, bishop d6. Remember this thematic move, which works especially well uh, when the white knight is not on f3 but on e2. Uh, 
Why uh, this circumstance is so important? Because d5 is not working. For example, after d5, you have always knight e5. So after bishop d6, white plays bishop a2. He is following his idea of transferring the bishop to b1. But um, in this position, the idea behind bishop d6 becomes clear. Now knight e7 will be played. Uh, black is taking the control of the d5 square. And here uh, you can see that uh, all the minor pieces are participating into the game. Knight f4, uh, white uh, is trying to um, uh, underline the vulnerability of the e6 pawn, um, making clear that some possible uh, sacrifices can work uh, in the future and also white is taking the control of the d5 square white is increasing the control of the d5 square and here uh, gavrikov um, came with a concept uh, that is really impressive so first of all he played the useful queen b8 move just forcing the weakening g3 so now rook d8 start putting uh, pressure on d4 and here, after rook e1, uh, you can even pause the video and think for a while on your own. Because I think that uh, Black uh, came up uh, with a very instructive idea. So, uh, I hope uh, that uh, you have found uh, the right solution. Gavrikov played bishop f4. So, it turns out that uh, the control of the d5 square and uh, the idea of exchanging pieces is much more important than keeping the pair of bishops. Uh, so remember, when you are playing against uh, a, an isolated pawn, you try to uh, exchange pieces. Uh, pieces that control the d5 square are especially important for you. So bishop takes f4, queen c8. The queen uh, is hidden for the c6 square in order to create the threats along the big diagonal. So f3, you see that uh, white is further weakening uh, his position. Queen c6, knight e4, knight d5, very thematic move. In the middle game, uh, we should not forget to block the pawn. And now, uh, instead of a move like bishop d2, uh, Rastenis uh, played bishop e3. This is not uh, the right decision, because now uh, black keeps exchanging pieces. And um, we know that every exchange favors the side that is playing against the isolated pawn. So queen takes a3, rook c8, uh, queen f2, now king f8, prophylactic move just uh, escaping from the opposition with the bishop that uh, can potentially uh, turn dangerous. Uh, I don't say that uh, this move is uh, obligatory. Of course, black has many other good ideas. And here you see that um, black keeps exchanging pieces. And uh, in the next move, uh, instead of playing something like knight e4, trying to complicate matters, uh, white uh, just uh, goes uh, into black's hand. So uh, bishop d5, bishop d5, queen e3, and we see even more exchanges here when we arrive at a very critical position. So uh, when you play uh, against isolated pawn, this kind of uh, endgame with two rooks and queen is uh, almost always winning for you. And actually, the plan is pretty simple. You can uh, just uh, triple your major pieces on the d file against the pawn. Sometimes you uh, you can play rook d6 and uh, put the queen behind following the uh, steps of Alekhin. And even if uh, your opponent uh, manages uh, to defend the pawn with all his pieces, uh, quite often he will be helpless uh, against the threat of e5. Of course, uh, he can play f4 in such structures, but uh, this move f4 uh, further weakens the king, and uh, at the end of the day, uh, this, uh, this move does not stop e5. Uh, in any case, you can play f6 and e5. 
So uh, rook d1, queen d7, here queen e4, uh, which was played, and e5. Queen e4 was a, a mistake, of course, uh, in a difficult position, but uh, let's, uh, let's say that he plays something else. It doesn't really matter, because after tripling your uh, major pieces, uh, you can play e5 in any case. So sooner or later, the advanced e5 will come. So queen e4 was played, e5, queen g4, f5, queen h4, rook c4, and uh, eventually uh, white lost the pawn and the game. This example was a clear il illustration of the play against the uh, isolated pawn. So uh, let me summarize uh, the practical ideas that you should know. First of all, it's very important to take uh, the control of the square in front of the pawn and you need to block the pawn. So uh, in the middle game, uh, this is the most important task. You block the pawn uh, and you, you get very firm control of the square in front of the pawn. Then you start exchanging pieces. In the end game, however, uh, uh, blocking the pawn is not so that important. It's uh, just sufficient to control the square in front of the pawn and you should uh, put pressure on the isolated pawn. So uh, in the middle game, you try to block the pawn. In the end game, you try to take it. Remember uh, that uh, uh, in all kinds of uh, heavy piece end games with two rooks and queen on the board, uh, uh, the side playing with an isolated pawn uh, ha has uh, a lot of trouble. So, uh, if you want uh, to, to um, further improve your understanding uh, of this topic, playing against an isolated pawn, you can uh, look at uh, our articles in Modern Chess Magazine. And um, I think that the strategy booster on our, our website is the perfect tool uh, of uh, practicing uh, your knowledge. In some of the sessions, uh, featuring uh, these important pawn structures, we will be uh, practicing by using the strategy booster. So this was the first lecture uh, featuring the play against an isolated pawn. And uh, from the next lecture, I will start showing some typical ideas which, um, which show how to play uh, with an isolated pawn. Thank you for watching and all the best.